following Ms. Summer's speech, we will have a commentary from our very own Professor Wolf, who you all know very well. And without any, any further delay, Professor Summers. Thank you. I am Christina Hoff Summers from the American Enterprise Institute. Before that, I taught philosophy for many years at Clark University. And I am a great fan of the Federalist Society and the Claire Booth Luce Institute, who arranged for me to be here. And I urge you to join, take part, attend the events of the Federalist Society. It's one of the great organizations. It has a large umbrella. You can be you know, a range of conservative to libertarian, uh, inclusive in that sense. And I would uh, urge you to join. <laughs> Liberals can come, too, and get a, the counterpoise from what you hear in most of your law classes. But never mind that. Um, several years ago, a major toy company, Hasbro Toys, test marketed a structure, kind of a playhouse slash fort that they wanted to market to both boys and girls. And for toy manufacturers, a gender neutral toy is the holy grail of toy manufacturing. It doubles your profits. And it's very hard to find a toy that will interest both boys and girls. There are a few famous breakthroughs, Mr. Potato Head and the Slinky, but that's, that's about it. Uh, anyway, they tested this structure. And what happened, they were in uh, Providence, Rhode Island at their laboratory and the boys came in the girls came in and played constructively they put the dollies in the doll carriage they played house the boys without exception took a look at the situation clambered up to the top of the roof and catapulted the toy baby carriage from the roof and this uh, general manager came to a brilliant explanation Uh, she said my goodness boys and girls are different (laughs) well they are rather different and these differences are quite salient in the area of education Uh, Overall, boys are academically weaker than girls. And um, in the time that I have, I'll try to give you the best information I can on where the boys are. Uh, How much time should I speak? What's the ideal? 25. 25, okay. Will you give me this a five-minute warning, and then I'll wrap it up, because I can go on all day. Uh, I'm going to try to give you the most up-to-date information on where the boys are. And I'll also say a word about the politics that surround the whole issue of gender and education. Um, Because there are some women's advocates, lobbying groups, especially the American Association of University Women, the National Women's Law Center, these lobbying groups in Washington, D.C., who think the new concern (coughs) for boys is part of a backlash against women. It's not, but there's no way to convince them otherwise. Um, The good news is that we have an abundance of objective information about how kids are doing in school. The Department of Education collects just a compulsive amount of data on how kids are faring. And uh, they have, a few years ago, they examined 44 indicators of academic equity. And what they found was that there were a few areas where boys were actually stronger than girls. Um, And there were more boys in sports and more boys in physics classes. on the other hand, in most of the other indicators, many of them they were, there was no difference, but a, a, a large majority of them, girls were ahead of boys. And they concluded, quote, there is evidence that the female advantage in school performance is real and persistent. Now, what are their findings? The National Association of Education Progress provides a very objective picture of how kids are doing. And what you find is that in recent years, it used to be that there was a math gap that was fairly large, never very big, but a fairly large math gap favoring boys, that has narrowed. There has been for years a large and growing gap favoring girls in reading and writing. And that gap, either it's, very, it's as large as it's ever been, and in some cases it's, it's larger where writing is concerned. Um, the average 15-year-old boy writes like a, a 13-year-old girl. And um, if you look at honors classes, valedictorians, who's winning all the prizes, it's girls, girls, girls. According to the college board, girls now take more honors math and science programs. They are 54% girls, 46% boys. And then you get out of the math and science, and it's just girls prevail. Uh, Something like English and foreign language, it's uh, 61%, 62% female. What about college? U.S. Department of Education t- data show that today 50% of the bachelor's degrees, 59% of master's, and 50% of doctorates go to women. And according to the, their projections, by 2020, this college gap, 
favoring girls is going to become a chasm. There's an expert, uh, Tom Mortensen, from the Pell Institute for the Study of Opportunity in Higher Education, and he quipped, only half facetiously, that if current trends continue, the last male will graduate from college in 2068. Now, so what is the government doing? We have this gap. Uh, it's growing. There has been a massive and much celebrated effort to strengthen girls in math and science in all areas. We had you know, massive numbers of self-esteem programs. We took our daughter to work. Everybody read Reviving Ophelia. Uh, and it, 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 girls were classified in the mid-'90s as an underserved population. And we passed the Gender Equity Act, um, which counted them as discriminated against minority. So anyway, millions and millions of dollars have been spent to improve girls' achievements. Where are the dollars for boys? For the reading gap, the writing gap, the college attendance gap, the I don't care about school gap. Far more boys than girls from the earliest age just don't care about it. And it's very hard. It's an art to interest the typical little boy in school. So what we have, I think the reason that there's so little attention to the boys is that, in a nutshell, historically women were oppressed. And in the 60s and 70s, uh, we built a, a network of women's organizations, this powerful lobbying group. But what happens when you're successful? What happens when you're the Association of University Women? And you're fighting to you know, give women, women are, you know, there are fewer women. It's now the 1950s, the 1960s, fewer women than men in college. And then suddenly, 1970, 1980, they're equal in number. And then the women start going they, uh, this upward trajectory, and the men just go nowhere. Do you shut up, shut your doors and declare victory and go home? That isn't what happens. The, the AAUW, if anything, the American Association of University of Women, is angrier today than ever. Their polemics, their language, their rhetoric. I'll quote them in a minute. You'll see for yourself. Um, a few years ago, the New York Times had a story, front page story, <clears throat> with the headline, Troubling Label for Hispanics, Girls Most Likely to Drop Out. I read this story. There were charts, photos, graphs. It was very alarming. And you went away really worried about these girls. Uh, it was informative and, as I said, distressing. But here was what was very strange about this article. In the paragraph six, there was just a little throwaway line which said, the only group that has higher dropout rates among <coughs> students is Hispanic boys. That was the last we heard of it. Uh, it turned out that 31% of Hispanic boys drop out. Um, and the, for girls, it was it was 25 percent. Now, I called up the writer. I was just so frustrated by this kind of reporting, and I just wondered about the logic of declaring a crisis for girls and giving the reader, the every New York Times reader, the clear idea that the girls were most at risk. I mean, why not tell the whole story? Yes, those girls are in trouble, but why not tell about the boys who were, by every measure, in more serious trouble? Uh, so I called the the reporter, Dana Kennedy, and asked her about it. And she was very nice. And she said, well, look, the AAUW just did a study called Latinas at School. And we wanted to write about it. And I'm sure there'll be a study about boys, Latinos in school. And we'll write about that. Don't hold your breath. No such study. Well, there have been studies, but the New York Times doesn't, doesn't write about them. Because partly because they don't have that lobby behind them. There's no National Women's Law Center. There's no AAUW. In my view, the treatment of Hispanic boys is symptomatic, emblematic of the way boys are treated um, than in, uh, in the society at large. Uh, boys in all groups uh, are at greater academic risk, but they get very little attention. Now, as I said, not everyone agrees with my analysis. Uh, some say the problem is manufactured. It's part of a continuing backlash against women and girls. Um, I don't know what would count as evidence. A friend of mine once said, uh, that you know, when colleges are you know 60 percent women. What if they become 70 percent? What if there are no men at all? Will that be fair? Will that finally be fair? And they, they're, you know, because our colleges now are 60 percent women, and by all projections, it's going. This is going to grow 57 to 60 to 65 on many college campuses. But they still have women's centers where women are treated as the the oppressed sex. Um, Boys are languishing, and in, in, uh, one another thing the women's groups will say is, well, it's really only African-American boys, or it's really only Latino boys. No, that's just not true. In every category, of course, they're most at risk, and those groups are most 
for reasons we don't quite understand, most of the advantages of the of the civil rights movement in education accrued to, to women and not to, not to men. Uh, but if you look at working class boys, if you, they're among the, the hardest hit. If you look at a school like Bloomsburg State University, which is largely uh, students from the white uh, working class, it's, uh, I think the graduating class last year was 61% female. Something is wrong here. Um, and the question is, what can we do about it? Now, one thing I will tell you is if you ask the gender scholars, their solution for them is that, well, it's something to do with masculinity. We have to change boys' masculinity. And for years, there were efforts. It was actually kind of sad, I mean, because the boys would not cooperate, but there were these massive efforts to make the boys play more like girls. The typical play of little girls is theatrical play or uh, turn-taking turn games, um, playing school, playing house. Boys, it's that uh, large motor, outdoor, rough and tumble play. Girls like to rough and tumble too, but they do it a lot less. And parents, adults, teachers, it makes them a little nervous. Now, I will tell you that healthy rough and tumble play by those experts like Anthony Pellegrini at the University of Minnesota has written brilliantly on this topic. This is the essential universal play of little boys everywhere. There is no culture known to man or woman where little boys don't engage in far more rough and tumble play. And it involves a lot of mock fighting, shouting, sound effects, increasingly in the United States and maybe in Western Europe, maybe in Sweden, where they're trying to eliminate gender in some of their schools. Uh, in the United States, they, there's a failure to distinguish between rough and tumble play and violence. And so little boys who are just innocently playing cops and robbers or running around the teacher thinks it's violent. Now, in violence, kids part as enemies. There are tears. There's unhappiness. It's not a, not, not a cheerful event. Rough and tumble play, the boys can hardly repress their, their joy. It's joyful. It's wild. Um, but increasingly, in our schools, it, there are schools that have no recess. Now, we don't have lobbying groups for little boys, so no one does a disparate impact study. It says you eliminate recess. By, by the way, as speaking as a, a girl, a former girl, I loved recess. But for boys, it is um, it, it's, it has a much more severe impact for mo most little boys because that's their that's their way of playing. And it seems to me uh, what we should be doing is meeting boys halfway. I don't say that we have to. People say, "Oh, Christina Hoff Summer says let boys be boys," and that's so horrible because they associate being a boy with being violent and antisocial. Well, first of all, that's not true. That's not fair. It's a very small percentage of boys who are violent and antisocial. They're, most of them are rough and tumblers. They're not all of them, but most of them. Um, and so what I say is, yes, you have to civilize little boys. You have to turn them into gentlemen. Uh, if a society fails to socialize little boys, they have very unpleasant ways of making themselves noticed. So there's no question that we have to put efforts to open their hearts and make them um, kind and, and good individuals, but that doesn't mean trying to turn them into girls. Yet at Wellesley College, at the Harvard Graduate School of Education, you have these gender experts, and what are their ideas? Try to find ways to, to get boys to calm down, and they had a whole project to get them to play with dolls. And the idea was that if boys would play with dolls, they would become calmer, gentler, and maybe they would help take care of babies later on. We had to wean them away from that rough and tumble activity. It just didn't work. It creates havoc in the classroom. If you try to get fifth, you know, five-year-old, six-year-old boys, I mean, they'll play with them, but then they can use them. You know, at Wellesley, I saw this professor had a tub of, of, of uh, bubbles and said, oh, well, if you make it into a water game, the boys will like it. Yes, but the teacher said they turned the dolls into torpedoes. <laughs> and, <laughs> and they were, it's not going to work. And why do this? What, and I feel that we are increasingly making little boys feel ashamed of who they are. In many classrooms, as a colleague of mine has said, increasingly elementary schools, junior high schools, and even high schools are run by women for girls. Boys are there on sufferance. And uh, they are, as I said, they're winning all the prizes. And the boys, increasingly, we have dropout rates and boys not keeping up. Boys not thinking of, of, of school a place where they belong. How can we do that? Now, there are many societies in the past that have favored boys over girls. And I became a, a feminist in the 70s, so I didn't like it. I don't like male chauvinism. Uh, but I don't like the reverse. And I feel today 
that we have a new kind of feminism, which has not adjusted to the times, is not looking at the reality of the lives of most boys and girls, and they're still addicted to a rhetoric that was great in 1972, but it's the new millennium. It's a new world. I don't say there aren't equity issues, um, but uh, overall, I think that the major issues for a, a reasonable feminism are in other parts of the world. In the United States, feminism has been a great success story. Um, so, so what I, I think is that we have to find, as I said, find our way back to making our classrooms friendlier places for boys. For uh, Just to give you some silly examples, a friend of mine, uh, well, no, first a silly example, then a serious example. The silly one is they, they tried to change games like tug of war to tug of peace. And uh, <laughs> this is recommended in the Wellesley literature or the, I guess it was the national... Uh, one of the big teachers' unions came out with a journal, a, a, a group of activities to calm children down, read boys. And they said, well, tag, the game of tag is very common in the playground and the kids act out. So they suggested replacing it with a game called Circle of Friends, uh, where there were no one, it's, it's a laugh, we can play it later. It's a very calm and, and, and <laughs> encouraging game. But nobody is ever out. I don't know what the kids do or how this works, but... Uh, but a more serious example is uh, Sandra Stotsky was, she's at the University of Missouri now, but she was at the Harvard Graduate School of Education, and she studied social studies textbooks for 7th and 8th grade kids. And she said you would come away thinking the West was settled by teenage girls traveling with their parents. Now, because they wanted to edit out the guys because there was too much war and too much conquest and too much uh, just a rough and tumble activity. Uh, when my son was a senior in high school, his class went on a camping trip in the desert, and um, he loved it. But there was one activity that really bothered him. Uh, this creative writing facilitator, this creativity facilitator, had visited the camp, and they were told to take this notebook and a candle and some matches and walk out and just a little bit into the distance in the desert at dusk and sit down in the sand and just write about... Oh, she instructed them to find yourself. And I'm sure all the kids were a little puzzled by this, but the boys were really sort of baffled. And the girls went off, and they wrote, they poured their heart out about, I don't know, the startling loneliness of the desert or whatever. And the boys just kind of drifted towards each other, threw the uh, notebooks into a pile, took the matches, <laughs> and made a bonfire. And the, uh, the camp instructor was horrified. She, the facilitator, she thought they were little sociopaths and they were, you know, watch my son and his friends as, oh God, what will I do next? And they, were, they were not sociopaths, they weren't proto-arsonists, or they were just <laughs> boys. And increasingly a creature such as a boy is odd man out. He's, he's, he's something startling to an instructor from our schools of education, which are, which treat girls as the norm and boys as the derelict exception. As I said, uh, Boys are, there are differences in the sexes. There are exceptions, and I'm, no matter how many times I say this, someone will say, she said all girls are like this and all boys are like that. I did not say that. There are exceptions, but there are also rules. And as a rule, boys have better spatial reasoning <coughs> skills, and they are more interested in gadgets. If you want to get them to read, you'll have more luck rather than giving them uh, books about novels. Uh, give them books about things or history with male heroes. They might like that, too. Uh, and girls are better at verbally. So Mother Nature was fair in this sense, is that girls have a distinct verbal advantage and boys have a, an advantage in, in reading and writing. Now, uh, and there are other areas where boys are, as I said, more risk-taking, uh, more comp competitive, at least in a physical sense, and um, uh, they're more likely to be interested in the world of objects rather than the world of people. So you, I don't know that it's necessarily discrimination that you far, find more males majoring in engineering and more females in psychology and education. It's not a conspiracy of the patriarchal hegemony that women enter these fields. Yes, they pay less, but for a lot of women, it's simply worth it to go into something that fascinates you rather than something that pays less. So people say, why should we worry about the boys? Women are paid less. and and. But if you look at the pay gap responsibly, even feminist economists will tell you it's not because evil employers are cheating women out of their salary. It's because men and women behave differently. They go into different fields, and even when they go into the same field, they don't 
act exactly the same way. They work different hours. They go into different sub subspecialties. Um, how much time? Six or seven minutes. Oh, that's that's good. Um, now, it, speaking to you as law students, what I want to tell you is that a lot of the troubles right now for boys are driven by by lawyers, by by. Um, <coughs> Women at the mostly at the National Women's Law Center, for example, uh, and they one of the things they're going after there there are two areas I said where boys stand out, and it's in physics and maybe engineering programs for sure, and sports. There are more, still more boys in sports, but what if it turns out to be the case that in terms of being obsessed by sports, there's just more guys than girls. There are girls who are sports obsessive. There are girl jocks. There are brilliant women athletes. No question about it. But there's simply more males who turn up and want to be on teams. So if you want, if you have a college that's at the tipping point, as the, as the uh, admissions officers call it, where you're about to get 61, 62, 65 percent females, what happens is then the females don't want to go there anymore because they would like to at least have a, one date in college. So if you're getting too many females, it tips, and then the, the I think the guys will still be willing to go. They don't seem to mind that. That's another problem. The boys are not protesting being. Uh, you know, one boy and four girls for every boy kind of. Thing. <laughs> but uh, what happens is, if you if you want to if you want to have uh, at a sports team, most colleges are already getting D's and F'd by the National Women's Sports Council because they have too many males on their teams. Now, here's an example: we had this idealistic law, Title IX equity law, that said you know if you if, that you have to have. You, you can't discriminate against women in any educational program uh, that's federally funded. Now, what does not discriminating mean? To me, it means equality of opportunity. And it was terrible when the women's teams were just second-class citizens and had no opportunities or very few opportunities. But what happened because of the pressure of mostly feminist litigators is that this Title IX equity law has been twisted into uh, a quota regime. Worse than that, it's called proportionality. Quotas would be good for boys if you had 50-50 quota. What they have is that if your school is 60% female, you have to have 60% athletes, or you're getting an F. So what schools do is that they, they try to recruit, uh, if they try to recruit young men, uh, and one thing you can do, and schools have found this, is that you, you uh, start a football team or start an engineering program, and you will attract more guys. But if you do that, you immediately run a foul of Title IX as it's currently been interpreted. And so it's been interpreted in a ways that we had to eliminate male wrestling teams and diving teams. I mean, what is that all about? To me, what that's about is feminism just without, I would, I would say, more than common sense, without mercy. And that, that's, that is not what it was supposed to be about, but that's what it's come to. And it's your generation that's got to set it right because it's going to take it. Litigators created this problem. Litigators are probably going to have to help solve it. Uh, the AAUW, about a year ago, re released a warning to adversaries who get in the way of their equity initiatives. And here's what they say. You find this on their websites. Our adversaries know that the AAUW is a force to be reckoned with. We are issuing fair warning. We are breaking through barriers. They're knocking down doors that are already open, but never mind. We're breaking through barriers. We mean it. We've done it before. We are coming after them again and again if we have to, all of us, all the time. <laughs> now, that's what you're going to run into if you challenge it. Now, isn't that fun to have a whole group of angry, litigious people um, you ask someone, like, do you remember what happened with Larry Summers, the president of Harvard University? He dared to suggest the possibility. He didn't assert it. He just said there might be differences between men and women that explain why you have more males than females at the very high echelons of, of math, university math and science. Whoa! He was, it was career diminishing, let's put it that way. For anyone in academia that would challenge, and it's not just the AAUW. There's a vast network, which, as I said, for good reason, it it developed in the 60s and 70s, but now it went, once we needed it, now it won't go away. And it's going to be up to you to contend with it. And, and you may say, well, I don't really care. How serious can it be? Just read the headlines. Read what is happening to young men and, and young women that it, typically you want to marry somebody with the same education. That's not going to happen. There's going to be this huge education gap. We're going to have 
a large population of highly educated women and less, increasingly less educated men, this mismatch. It doesn't have to happen. And I also think they'll be, by not educating boys, I do think that they are the tinkerers and the inventors and the, just more technologically um, um, inclined. If you, if you look at the patent office, which I checked recently, it's still men who file almost all the patents, over 90%. So there may be some obsessive element or single-mindedness, or maybe it's the spatial reasoning skill. Who knows what it is? But uh, males have it, and I think that to ignore the education of males, we're also ignoring our technological future. I've tried to get some education economists to write about this, and nobody, it's just not a good career move to write about any topic that runs afoul of organizations that are going to march on you and organize litter campaigns. It's just exhausting. I'm not here to disparage, by the way, what was done to strengthen girls. A lot of the programs were great. I don't say, you know, you take your daughters to work day. That was kind of fun, I guess. But now they take boys. That's better. Uh, they need a, day, a career day as well. The, but the best research on girls for, in helping them in math and science, it was predicated on, on helping the girls, on strengthening, not viewing them as kind of defective or pathological. Uh, it was, there were good faith efforts to understand girls, to, to strengthen them academically. Well, now, let's do that for boys as well. The first thing to say is that sociologists long ago or, uh, identified something called aberrational masculinity. And an, a, an aberrational or pathologically masculine boy, um, it's, it's the reverse of what a boy should be. Instead of building, he destroys. Instead of protecting women and children, he exploits. And if you have too many males like that in your society, you're at great risk of, of devastation and high levels of misery. Uh, men have to be civilized. But we have a method of civilizing men which does not include trying to be exactly like girls. And it's, that's that notion of a gentleman, or you can do it through good sportsmanship. There are many ways to civilize a young man without insisting, without making him feel guilty about his impulses or his high, you know, uh, is, is um, just obstreperousness or unruly nature. There are ways that, and, and I think there are teachers that are brilliant at doing it, who like boys. And as any, most of the boys in this room can tell me, there a lot of teachers don't like boys very much, and the boys know it. And uh, that doesn't work out well because then they don't, they don't want to do as well in the class. I remember always wanting to please my teachers, and then I found out my sons did not necessarily want to do that, and I couldn't understand how that could be. But anyway, uh, just a difference between average male and female in terms of caring about. So you do have to bring boys along, but in the European cultures, that's a big question. And I know some people try to get sort of national character. Maybe it works up to a point, but I would suspect there may be cultures that are certainly parts of the world where they have pathological masculinity and it's dangerous for everyone and has to be civilized. And we need to have these enlightenment principles as well as on the personal side, some, I believe, codes of gallantry. I do believe that it's, we used to think it was sexist in the 70s, men holding doors and men. Well, it turned out that a lot of this served a purpose to remind us that uh, men are physically stronger. And these were sort of gestures of respect and self-restraint. And maybe it was helpful to have that little boys internalize the idea that not only do you never hit a girl, but you have to have a certain uh, behavior of uh, certainly civility, but even gallantry and chivalry. Well, what I'm pointing to is, we, is boys, when we, we do, we look at, do you like school? Do you care about school? And what we do see is boys' disengagement is growing. And I, I can't, I don't have the ability, I don't have a network, I can't study this. So I asked, you know, teachers tell me, I asked teachers of 40 years, have you noticed a feminization or something? And they'll tell me, yes, the curriculum was very different. You know, the older teachers. Uh, I had a superintendent of schools of uh, Bloomfield Hills, Detroit, call me, a, a woman. But she said, I go into the classrooms, and they're, it, they're all the teachers are women, and everything on the board is, are things that women like. And there are flowers, and there's, you know, they, they're celebrating uh, quilts and women we admire, on and on. And um, the boys, she said, I want the, I'm hoping that there'll be a little something. And it's true, if you, if you, they probably do want rockets or spiders, or maybe, I remember a, a teacher in San Francisco had her children uh, in a public sixth grade or fifth grade, they had to make a quilt of women we admire. And again, you know, a feminist quilting environment, that's like a lot of fun for a boy. 
there he was. They all had to make these quilts, and little Jimmy made, uh, he had to make, a, oh, so he, a woman he admired, he decided he admired um, uh, Monica Sellis, this tennis court player that got attacked by a savage madman on the, on the court. So what he did is he made this little square of a tennis racket and a bloody dagger. And the teacher was horrified. She said, I would be too. I wouldn't want that on my quilt. I want violets. And, <laughs> uh, this was original in the history of quilting. And, uh, but so I think that, you know, you can have your quilts, but then you expect some dangerous animals and some weaponry. Um, and, you know, so I think that's what I worry is that a lot of boys, oh, I remember now one study the Department of Education did do, asking, trying to find out why kids drop out. And for girls, the number one reason is it's a sad one. There was pregnancy or some family-related crisis. For boys, it was that they just didn't feel anybody wanted them there. And that just it makes me cry that no one made this little boy feel, or seventh grade boy, that he was wanted there. And nobody's on that job. Because if you're at a school of education now, and I've met some recent graduates, uh, they're still focused on the shortchanged girl and Carol Gilligan and accommodating everybody but the boys. So there's, I think there's also there's a, just a, an invisible curriculum uh, which favors girls and makes a lot of boys feel bad about themselves. Now, upper middle class boys, you know, boy, the boys that are going to end up at the UPenn Law School, they can cope. And they probably have a lot of support. And you can, it's very hard. It's very hard to hold back those men that are destined to be at the at the very high end of the achievement distribution. And that's one last thing I'll say is that, that men uh, do find themselves at the extremes. If you talk to the people who design tests, the psychometricians, they'll tell you that uh, give take, give a test to any demographically correct group of people, and you will find the males are overrepresented at both extremes. So you have more males who have freakishly high IQs, male, you know, super geniuses, and more males who are anti-geniuses, if you will, <laughs> dullards, idiots. Uh, they're just more on both ends. So yes, there are more men who are CEOs of Fortune 500s. There are also a hell of a lot more men who are in maximum security <coughs> prisons. And it's everywhere in the world. More men are fail spectacularly and succeed spectacularly. And so the women's groups have to be consistent. If you're worried about like 500 men who are CEOs of Fortune 500, what about millions of men you know, who are in prison? And it may be, Camille Paglia is my favorite dissident feminist. And if you, if you read anyone, read Camille Paglia. She, was just, she just writes uh, in a very, very original way about all these issues. And she, she's a, uh, a dissident feminist. She's a, a lesbian, a pagan, Catholic, uh, Democrat, she's everything, but there she is. And she's at, in, in Philadelphia at the University of the Arts. And she's my favorite. I think if the gender, if people say, well, gender scholars haven't produced really any geniuses or anything. She's the closest. And um, anyway, she, she said, well, the reason we don't have female Mozarts is the same reason we don't have female Jack the Rippers. In other words, that, that kind of uh, risk-taking monomaniacal, obsessive, it's more common in males. And, you know, let's hope it, we can end up with a Mozart, but you can end up with a, a mad dog criminal as well. And you'll find more males in both categories. And it's not something like to be, oh, it's an injustice, it's unfair. It may be the way the world is. Thank you.